Hi guys, Mr. Jaeger here, and welcome to day three which of the IAE 2952, and it is Aegis Day! Yes! The former evil military super budget company that once served the Mezzo regime is now brought back down to Earth with a smack and a whole bunch of other ships in line and today's lineup of ships is quite plentiful as the previous two episodes have been rather lengthy as uh, i'm going to be going to uh, going to be toning things down a bit we're not going to be exploring all of the vessels and checking out all of the things because first of all i've done it in the past and enough of the and the vessels are, are, are some of this event some of the vessels here have been explored long enough for you guys to know what it is so to try and keep these episodes relatively reasonable i'm going to try and sort of skim down on exploring the vessels but we're still going to have a look around and have a bit of good old talk about these particular vessels and my thoughts on the matter and i hope you guys have been enjoying this little series i do enjoy doing these little episodes because it is quite nice it's admittedly it's only like a few times a year i get to enjoy looking at all of these wonderful ships and it's also nice to see them in this really nice looking form of uh, iae so, today, we get to start off with the big boy in the room, which is, of course, the Aegis Ref yeah, Reclaimer. There we go. I was about to say Redeemer, but I don't know. We're going to get that into that in a second, which is a good ship, by the way. <laughs> no bias at all, it's fair. So, we're finally shedding ourselves of the shitty civilianness of Origin Jump Works, and we are entering into the militaristic style vessels of Aegis Dynamics. Now, overall, I would say Aegis Dynamics is, in my personal opinion, a pretty alright company. Like, I wouldn't say they're my favourite, but they do have some very good ships, one of which, of course, being the best starter ship in the game. And potentially, I may have to add until this patch, which will be interesting. But rather, rather than to hark on about something, let's get started immediately by talking about the Sabre. So the Sabre is a combat space superiority fighter. It's a bit, uh, it's basically a bit more of a medium fighter, more of a hit and run fighter than its more famous counterpart, which is of course the Gladius. So the Gladius, of course, is the famous light fighter, which we'll be seeing in as well today. But um, to the, but but in the initial frontal area, the Aegis Dynamics Saber is our main port of call, and it is a rather glorious-looking ship. I can definitely see audio dying a bit there. I can definitely see the wonders of this thing. And ah, to be fair, it it was on my list for a while, and I did want to get it. And maybe in the future, I might want to get it again, because it is a very nice looking vessel. But I can't honestly say it's... The desire has definitely gone to trying to get as many single seat fighters as possible. And I've been kind of leaning more towards um, sort of more industrial vessels. But still, this is a very nice looking ship. In terms of weaponry, it is equipped with... We've got the page up and everything on that advance. Um, four, four size three Panther repeaters, which, yep, and a couple, uh, and four, two size, and two size four missile racks with two, uh, size three missiles known as Arrested Threes and two Thunderbolt Threes, uh, available. This ship does not have any kind of stowage or anything like that, well, storage. Storage it does apparently have a 25k SU storage on the outside as well as a dedicated gun rack similar to the similar to the Gladius which if we can find where we can store such things I think ah oh, there it is. So we open that out and there you go. So there's the options for storing the weapons, the stowage, all sorts of wondrous things. So has, so for any solo pilot out there wanting to make a name for themselves, do a bit of exploring, this ship will do you fine, uh, but probably not for long. Like You probably need to be next to a carrier or something like that. So if your ship is ever shot down or you're stuck on a planet and you can't get off, then there you go. But apart from that, nothing too snazzy. And then um, you've got this, uh, this Sabre Comet, which apart from a different skin, is actually kind of worse. And that comes from an experienced pilot. I had a friend who is a major Sabre fan, and he says from the, from the horse's mouth 
that this version is just a shitter version of the Saber. It's got more components aimed for stealth, it's meant to be very much like trying to use EMPs and close range weaponry, and I can tell that this weapon, which is the shotgun variant of any kind of thing, that yes, I will concur with his opinion. Apart from having a different kind of cockpit window tint, and again, the different skins, this is just a kind of worse form of uh, Saber, because it's mainly designed as kind of a stealth fighter, rather than an actual dedicated hit-and-run fighter that its original counterpart does kind of go with. So, yeah, uh, a bit of a thing. And then, of course, in the center of the room, we are greeted with a hell of a sight, which is, of course, the... Aegis Dynamics Reclaimer, which is, at the moment, a bit of a celebrity. It's kind of had its uh, its form put back into uh, put back into it because originally when the ship came out, it was listed as the largest ship, flyable ship in Star Citizen, and and you can see why. Like its its design is beautiful. It looks stunning, and this is the kind of thing the thing that makes me a weird person because this kind of design, this really bulky, mechanical, industrial kind of design that has no desire to try and look at all pretty. Oh, handy. Um, is just, I love it. I absolutely love it. And we're just going to have, we will explore this vessel because I do like this vessel. Oh, I'm trying to remember, ow. Trying to remember how to get back up onto this ship. Uh, how do you get back up onto the ship? Because there's like a thing you press and you can... There's a button somewhere on here that you press. Because someone's able to get off. Hello. It's basically a sort of uh, how to get on. How, do you... how does one do this? Because I remember someone doing this at one point, And you can actually... Oh, there we go. We did it. Right, so I'm actually getting teleported. Well, teleported. Oh, God. Oh god, oh god, oh god. And I'm alive. <laughs> oh Jesus God Emperor. That was close. So yes, this is the Reclaimer. And as you can see, in comparison to yesterday when we had that wonderful image of the very much refined and snazzy version of uh, the... Oh, nice engineering station. Of the... 890 jump. This vessel is completely opposite to that, which is wonderful. So the Reclaimer is, for those who don't know, a salvage ship. This vessel is designed purely to go about and grab as much shit in the universe. And eventually this vessel will be having quite a bit of use. Uh, it is already quite famous. Well, it was already famous originally because it was the largest ship in the flyable ship in the game with its own... Um, uh, with its own capacity to doing stuff. Unfortunately, salvage mechanics being what they were meant that it was very much not... Um, sadly, the salvage, sadly um, because the salvage mechanics is now only a thing that are coming in the next patch, and unfortunately it's quite a low uh, level of salvage in comparison, we're not probably going to see that much in terms of usage for the for the reclaimer however the ship has begun the, the ship has kind of become a bit more of a celebrity because there's a number of missions now that involve the reclaimer the first mission of course is the nine tails mission where you are sent into the verse to try and reclaim some data that was stolen by the uh, thing and you've got some remote turrets that the crew can man to save the ship or not depending on their mindset there's a couple of uh, ladders and stuff. This also has a very long ladder. Very long ladder, but it does look pretty cool. We're just going to climb our way up, because I don't really trust elevators in ships, at least not the small ones. Big ones are a little bit more okay, but this one's a bit there. So as we go up into the higher elevator, this 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 ship was big. This ship was very big, and for some reason I've taken damage, because of course I have. There's a grab generator, and... We are now in the crew habitation quarters slash uh, turret access as well. And there's a, the lift that takes us up or takes us down to the bridge. And this is the drone room where there are various drones that you are, that are constructed uh, or maintained that the controllers can basically send down to help with excavation, which is pretty nice. But we are still working our way towards the habitation zone. Here is a little offshoot 
engineering point. But the thing that you will see about this particular vessel is the alien vibe you get. You know, it's very rustic. It's very the light lo the light levels are very low. It's very, you know, gratuitous. And this next area, if you've not seen the alien films, you've missed out. Especially the first one. I mean, come on. This right here. This room right here. I just ooh. Ooh. It's a lovely room. It's a very lovely room. And again, the reason why I personally love this thing is I'm weird, and I love the grime. I love that shitty, tacky tub with the very basic sort of industrial-grade things. Industrial vehicles is, is my thing. I don't know why. I'm weird. And we have our own little docking collar, which now, of course, docking being a thing, is actually a viable thing. Which is cool. Whether or not that actually works IRL, um, well, you know, in the game, I don't know. But... You know, it's, we can do it now, which is nice. And here, of course, is the habitation line. Now, as I said, the other mission that this vessel is famous for is sadly because this vessel... Uh, it's sadly... Well, it's, it's, it's kind of really fucking cool because it's the first time we get to do it in Star Citizen. But it's also really sad because, unfortunately, um, it result <laughs> requires this vessel to be fucked, in a sense. And it's basically the box mission where you go onto the planet and go to a wreck of a um, of an orig of a reclaimer that has crashed into the side of a planet and now has become a derelict that nine tails crooks have taken advantage of so it's two missions where bandits are taking cover inside a ship and you're just sort of staring at there's the other docking collars and as again you can see the level of grime in this ship is wondrous and uh, we're now going to... And I, I am kind of glossing this particular ship. But there are different rooms. There's salvage processing, cargo hold, the salvage balcony, all sorts. And one thing I'm hoping we're going to get to do in the future, once salvage becomes more of a thing, is of course have ships like these floating around the verse doing their own thing. And you being able to explore and, and be able to like be part of a crew of salvagers. And it's just the fun of all of that mixed in ah oh, it just it's one of those re i'm again it's one of those games where i'm one of those no i'm kind of one of those freaks who just loves the sh the most mundane shit when it comes to some games because just like flying around the verse and being able to like salvage ships gather the materials build up a little bit of a repertoire turn them refine them and all that jazz that to me it just sounds awesome and to just, just to sort of, just imagine doing that with this thing. Ooh, definitely nice. Definitely, definitely nice. Though I have to see how I fare with the Volca, uh, sorry, with a Vulture, with eight, with uh, Drake Interplanetary, because that's a ship I'll need to have a look at in the near future. So let's have a look. See, whilst the text just decides to load. So at least I can see that I am there. Let's see if the other side is pretty good. There we go. Uh, nope. No dice. <laughs> Ooh, mystery time, isn't it wonderful? Now, I think I can roughly see what... Uh, oh, there we go. So, today what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go around the host. I think what I'll do is I'll probably go uh, left to right. Or should I go right to left? You know what? I'm going to go right to left this time. Because I think I've been doing the left to right last year. So, I think I'm going to go right to left this year. So, uh, we'll, go, we'll start with the Gladius and the Hammerhead, obviously, and then make our way towards the Avengers series before heading over to the Vanguard, then over to the Eclipse and the Retali, and then finally we'll solve off with the Nautilus and the Vulcan. So without further ado, let's get cracking. So, we enter into the next room, and in this one, of course, houses a ship which requires practically no introduction, but I'll talk about it anyway. This is, of course, the Gladius. The Gladius is pretty much the everyman's fighter. It's been in the game for quite some time, and virtually every PvPer in Star Citizen has used this ship, or has has off and you know has faced against this ship in combat. It's one of the more famous vessels in Star Citizen. I think it's one of the ones that you see often inside the UEE's fleet. And it definitely shows quite a strong, has definitely got quite a strong 
presence in any particular case, despite being such a light fighter. It's still, it is considered a light fighter, mine, due to the fact that it's, well, obviously its size and its design make it very nimble and quick to do stuff, but obviously its loadout, its frame and shielding can't hold out forever, and if you get a good solid hit on it, it will explode. Now, I'll tell you first and foremost, I'm not a PvP a PvP -er pilot. Um, I'm primarily PvE. Uh, I've done a couple of bits of PvP, but I'm by no means a skilled uh, in that particular regard. So I cannot say for certain the, in terms of like, oh my god, this thing's the worst bloody PvP police ship of the game, and there are so many better, or oh, this thing's amazing, blah blah blah. I can only sort of talk about my experiences with this ship, which is I did own this ship for a limited amount of time, but again, this was just as when I was sort of getting into the mood more for heavier ships and more uh, industrial ships, but. In terms of enjoyment factor, this thing is a pretty nifty vessel. Uh, it's armed with, if we go to the page, one Mantis size 3, two, two size 3 Panther Repeaters, which look more like size 2, so probably going to be along those lines. We've got a couple of missile racks, which, yep, there they are, which house a couple of size 2 Ignite 2s and a couple of size 3 Arrest of threes, which makes, yep, matches that perfectly. So this might be a size three Panther Repeater, which more looks like a size two, to be fair. But still, this vessel has a pretty impressive packing out. And again, size three is nothing to laugh at, most certainly. But again, it's a light fighter frame. It doesn't really have the heavy punching power. But it's nimble and fast and effective. Though again, the thing I mentioned in yesterday's episode about the flight mechanics changing in the near future, that is going to make things very interesting if it does affect the flying mechanics as much as I think it will. It may make the vessel even more impressive, but it may also make it less impressive. We, we will see. So this is the Valiant edition. And as you can see, everyone's practically stripped all of the things. There are, of course, the components. Uh, there are different ve different types of weapons and loadouts. Now, the, in terms of weapons, oh, in terms of ship characteristics, the Aegis Valiant, is, if you were, is not actually, uh, there's not really that much difference. I think the only difference is just the weapon loadout is slightly different. So obviously, you've, instead of having a Gatling gun, it's a repeater. Uh, you've got some, oh, what are those things called? I think they're just normal laser cannons. You've got some size... We've got four size 1 missiles on the end, and you've got a size 3 Nov PS3. Well, we'll go with that, Nov PS3. Um, and the main reason for this particular vessel is that it's actually in, built in memoriam to a pilot by uh, Condi Hillard uh, for being the first human to defeat a Vandal in combat. So there you go. This, 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 the Gladius was the first vessel of the human race to knock out a Vandal vessel in space combat, which is pretty nice. So, bully for them in that respect. Now, here is a ship that I think personally, again, almost needs no introduction, but I also think this vessel is also possibly one of the first real multi crew style ships in Star Citizen. Of course, it is the hammerhead. It's it's not it's it's very distinctive gunboat level of design makes it quite a fun vessel to fly in. And I've, having been on the van hammerhead and partaken in some gunner ops, it's absolutely hilarious to fly around in. It's it's brilliant. Now I said this was one of the first ships I would personally say that made multi crew a thing because prior to the release of the hammerhead. There wasn't really a lot of ships that you could say, oh yeah, this is definitely a multi-crew style ship. I mean, the Caterpillar is the only thing that comes to mind that really says multi-crew. But that's not because of fun, that's more because of mandatory nature in that regard. So, it does of course mean that, you know, with, with its multiple turrets and multiple guns, which... I will I will say it's it's definitely armed to the teeth in that regard. You've got some and all and all of the turrets, of course, and all of the turrets it has. It's got six size four, uh, six size five man turrets with four a piece size four uh, Rhino repeaters. Though uh, in previous editions of the game, 
uh, before the ammunition costs became ludicrously expensive, they were actually armed with mich with uh, <laughs> with Gatling guns, which oh my god! <laughs> you you know the attrition um, monstrosity on the top of the Buccaneer? Yeah, imagine four of those on this turret. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was a nightmare. And again, if it's to any respectable pilot who has one of these things, you can upgrade them. <laughs> you don't want to for don't think about the running costs. All I'll say, don't think about the running costs. But if you want to run with you know six turrets of size four uh, attrition repeaters, <laughs> dear God, you can do that. Um, but still, the laser repeaters on this will do the job for you as well if you just want to roll with stock. But these things are amazing and makes any person's attempt at surviving uh, a combat mission with one of these around is almost nightmares. And also one of the more famous, and to a degree, this ship was also um, was relatively new at the time of the first Jump Town Wars, which was also quite a nice nifty little thing. So, uh, yeah, a very, very nice looking ship with a very, very, uh, well, with a very positive reputation. Though, mm, I just, oh God, I remember flying in one of these things for so long, and it, like when we were doing org ops and stuff. And again, being the gunner on one of those things, it, the thing about the multi crew gameplay is that the hammerhead gives players the ability to have that full aspect of function you know interactivity with their environment and i'm really looking forward to seeing what future editions of star citizens multi-crew gameplay can do to make this vessel even more awesome than it was before the other thing i like about it and this and this is more of a personal thing is in the pilot's area which or in the bridge obviously around here the pilot gets to have a full 180 degree um well, 180 degree view to us and a 90 degree view downwards as well. So you can actually see the ground below you and you can actually even stand on the glass. And I have to admit, since playing Halo Wars and seeing that and then seeing that thing in the uh, the Hammerhead, I really wanted to have a, a glass floor bridge in, in Star Citizen again. Just so you can have your ship looking down on the planet and being like, yep, <laughs> even if it's immensely impractical. <laughs> Just walking my way from one side of the room to the other, and I was came across this really nice holographic display of a C2 being chased by a crew. What I, which is I'm guessing, is the new, yeah, the Corsair, and being chased by a saber of all things as well. No, wait, hang on, it's the fucking Scorpius. Are oh, you? The X-Wing, effectively. So, basically, a C-2 Hercules being chased by a, a Corsair and an X-Wing. That's hilarious. That is... Yeah, that is cool. That is seriously cool, though. And it's just a little tiny thing that you wouldn't even notice. You could you could be walking along and you wouldn't even notice it. But it's nice to see. I appreciate your work, whoever did this. And I hope that whoever did do this gets a good pat on the back and says, Yeah, you've done a good job. I would say you've done a good job. So, um... Let us continue on to the room of legend. Well, I say legend. It's it's a legendarily good starter ship. This person's walking really slow. Oh, he's gone. He's faded out of reality. And here we are. So this room, of course, has a number of ships that need no... Well, okay, I keep saying need no introduction. But I will... Screw it. We'll go with these introductions. Because otherwise you'll have to stare at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? So, of course, we have... The, in this room, we have the Avenger Titan series, which of course is fated, to, which is labeled as the best starter ship in the game. Which of course, it pretty much is, isn't it? But then again, since Aegis, since Inter Break Into Planetary have decided to come along and say hi, uh, we've had that particular chain, you know, tone of thought, a chain of thought, interrupted somewhat. So what exactly makes the Avenger Titan so popular. What made this ship the ship that everyone says is, you know, why everyone loves this ship? Why do I have one still in my inventory, you know, my ship hanger? Why do I feel that this vessel is just perfect for most approaches? Well, there's a few reasons why I, you know, why many players would recommend this ship to newer players of Star Citizen. 
And that's because it's the perfect starter ship. It's the ship that every player can, that players can easily understand how it works, what it can do, and it gives the best, bre you know, broad option for giving, you know, for getting you started in Star Citizen. So, a few things to sort of highlight. First of all, you've got a good mixture of weaponry. You've got the size four Gatling laser. The Gatling, yes, Gatling laser. Yes, that's a laser, Mister Jaeger. Sorry. You've got a size 3 gimbaled, but you can turn into a size 4 fixed Gatling gun, which is wondrous, or the Mantis GT220 if you're that fast about names. And then you've got some size 2 Panther repeaters, or Badger repeaters, which are on a size 3 gimbal. So once again, take away the gimbal, you got yourself some size 3 repeaters or whatever weapons you want to have. So first of all, you're being given an opportunity to learn how to play the game with ease because you've got two gimbal assisted weapons which makes shooting in space a lot easier for those who are not so familiar with how space combat works in star citizen and then you've got additions of four missiles which is of course the ignite twos which are size two missiles so you've got four missiles in total giving you that additional level of yeah that additional level of control and in sort of understanding of how to do combat and like, okay, now you have missiles, so it's all, you know, again, it's all within a nice, neat little package. Second of all, the big re winner in my eye about uh, when it comes to vessels like this is, of course, the cargo bay. Now, this ship has a, its own cargo bay, which for some players is like, well, it doesn't really matter. But for the new players out there who just want to do box missions... This is most definitely a thing that you want to have, especially since you've got eight SEUs worth of cargo in that in tow, which gives you the freedom to kind of put as many boxes as you want within a relatively reasonable portion. And if you're desperate to put a vehicle in the back, you probably could put, like, maybe a Nox, maybe a, um, a Dragonfly, but I don't think you can. Like, at a push, maybe, but it would be awkward and it wouldn't be secure. Another reason why it would be nice to have this ship is, of course, the bed. The ability to log out in Star Citizen and wherever you land is a pretty unique option and does work. From my previous experiences, I thought you couldn't get it to work, but no, in fact, it does work, giving you that total freedom to, uh, to enjoy the ability to log out wherever the hell you are, which is a nice thing. And then finally... Entering into, entering into the ship's cockpit. The other unique thing as well is that apart from it passing the test, well, almost passing the, the test of the MFDs and whatnot, it also gives you a beautiful view of the upper area, completely uninterrupted, and it's like a plane. So if you're not too familiar with how ships handle in Star Citizen, you are at least given the benefit of knowing that, well, this ship looks more like a plane, so I know where to land, how to land, and how to do all these little things. And it's quite a rugged little craft, giving you that extra ability and forgiveness for not knowing what you're doing, which is also a pretty nice thing to do. I forgot to hop out the other side, but there is also another option for you to leave the plane via the little side window there. In fact, you know what, fuck it, we're, we're doing this. We're... We're retrying this so I can make to showcase to you how to get out on the left side. Now, as stated, this vessel is, at the moment, still the king, in, because I don't think we've quite gotten there yet. Wait, there it is. There we go. So we haven't quite gotten there yet, and I don't think... I, and to be fair, since this is still during the event, I don't know if the cutter is really going to take the crown just yet from the... Um, from the ship, from uh, the Titan Avenger for the best starter ship in the game. And to a degree, the Avenger Titan still has the advantage in two, well, maybe three aspects towards uh, the Cutter, which the first of course, which is firepower. The Cutter only has size one uh, lasers, which makes it incredibly difficult for it to do anything effective in combat. Whereas this thing has size three and can be upgraded to size four main weapons or size three fixed weapons or just with what they've got. 
You've also got the aerodynamics of a plane, which does help a lot in both Atmo and in space, though it doesn't have VTOL capacity, which again, future flying update may affect in the future. And second and third of all, of course, it is a more durable aircraft. It does have a bit more of a capacity to take a punch. It does have some slightly better shields and it is slightly bigger. So it does give that sense. But then again, despite its bigness and size, it's a little bit cramped, so who knows? So, what are the other variants of the vessel? Why do we have multiple Titan Avengers in here? Well, they're not Titan Avengers. This one, for example, is the Stalker pattern, which is the bounty hunting option. So, instead of having a cargo bay filled with emptiness, you've instead got a cargo bay filled with pods that allow criminals to have a nice old snooze before they're taken to prison. And then, of course, you've got the Stalk... Uh, the... not the Stalker... I want to say Warlock so the titan warlock which is the emp version of the ship which of course is a nice treat for anyone who wants to uh figure out why their computer isn't working oh it's because the knob head in the warlock flew by and decided to activate it and has a it has a really unique internal system in tow which yeah that's pretty cool and then finally we have the which version is this Titan Renegade, which is the kind of up-armored, slightly, um, more police version of the ship, which are, which sadly has not got a good paint cover paint scheme to it but this is the more advocacy style police vessel that you would receive you may be more combat orientated you've got some tarantulas instead of guns in there you've got the, still got the gatling thing still gimbaled mind you but still um Again, not a no, not really a huge difference between the Renegade and the yeah no, yeah like it's got different missiles, different components, but there's no real difference. Finger quote uh, like for example the Warlock and the Stalker patterns, but still it is a Titan Avenger that is what makes everyone loves it. And at this moment in time, it is still the king of the roost when it comes to starter ships. However, since the Cutter has entered the scene. Only time will tell whether the ship will finally be knocked off its pedestal by a much cheaper alternative, or if it's just going to simply be the, well, you get the cutter first, then you get the Titan Avenger afterwards. Well, we will see. We will see. But now on to another vessel which I own and love with all my heart. Ah, the Redeemer. The, cre the community created vessel, which originally started its life out as a troop transport and then evolved into a gunship. And this thing looks gorgeous. It's got nice, funky style engines on the side. It's got beautiful turrets, multiple turrets, which, depending on whether there is anyone in the bottom half of the ship, it actually is both controlled by the player or by its respective crew. We've also got some remote turrets at the top. We've got some. Well, we've got a turret at the top. We've got a remote turret on the side, and we've got some additional weapons as well that will pop out and make anyone's day a bit of a rough one. It also has some pretty powerful cannon on the side, as you can see here, and also on the wing. So, in terms of armaments, let's just showcase on the web page what we got. So, on the pilot weapons, we've got two C C88 cannons which are these little wonders, followed by the M5, I think M, I would like to say, yeah, the bearing M5A cannon alongside the ADB ballistic Gatling. And that's, again, depending on if you're if it's controlled or not by the players, because you can have uh, player control turrets. It's also an escape pod there, which is nice. And then finally, you've got some turrets as well, which is the yeah the AD58B turrets, which yeah, there's a fair amount. You've got a couple of turrets that will be able to be used by the players and do hella levels of damage. In terms of carry capacity, there's not really a lot. You have like two SEUs worth of storage, which is along here. So if you do have some cargo missions, there's where you can put your boxes. But this particular vessel is designed primarily for combat. This thing is pretty much you go into the field you drop in oh finally they've replaced the buttons again yeah in previous patches for some reason the button to open and close the storage bay is yeah they weren't open and that is indeed all loose food in there 
which when you start the game off, when you load the ship in for the first time, all this free food is yours, and as well as drinks, which is hilarious. Um, but no, so the way that the ship is designed is it's cut off into two points. You've got the wardrobes, the crew compartments, and everything else, which also act as um, as uh, escape pods. And you've got the shoe, the ship, the shoe, the shoe, the ship showering components, as well as the shitter and everything else like that. You know, usual on-duty forms. So there's a rich. Hey, look, it's a con it's a concierge member. Screaming of narcissism. And then here, up over here, is the upper deck. Now, technically speaking, I did say that this ship started its life out as a troop transport. And it did. And, of course, it turned into a gunship. Which, again, it has. But you could, at a push, put a small fire team's element squad inside this position. Because there are multiple seats for them. As well as the crew could also act as a fire team, depending on what kind of op you're running. Which is kind of nice. So along the sides here, we get access, and someone's very dutifully demonstrating a... Well, we'll be demonstrating the... Thank you very much, sir. Again, it's always the core pose. Demonstrating the robot, uh, remote-activated tur turrets on the side there. And there is, of course, the two manned turrets, one being here that you can access via there, and one turret at the back, which... The turret located there will take you to the turret on the bottom. The turret located here will take you to the turret on the top. So you have a nice little choice of which one you want to work with. And then, of course, if you wish to man into the center, this lovely thing. And there you go. So as you can see, we've got quite a nice view. And I've taken this thing into combat a few times, and it's been proven to be quite a useful ship, especially if you're doing like bounty hunting missions. I think that this mission is this ship is perfect for bounty hunting missions. Uh, because it basically gives you the freedom to uh, do some hella levels of damage towards any vessels. And again, if you've got some friends who want to man the other turrets as well, the the cannons on the side is... Well, the cannons in the turrets are extremely lethal. Those versions of Gatlings uh, aren't that very common to sell. And they're actually very potent uh, Gatling weapons. Which means uh, they, they, they can do some significant damage. They'll, they'll send a lot of people to hell uh, for what they'll be doing. But yeah, fun times. But for the pilot, uh, in, terms, in terms of maneuverability, it's not a dogfighter. Like, it is pretty much a forward-facing. You go into the thick of it, and you put a lot of your shields at the front to ensure that you do not die. Um, but there are shield coverage around, uh, I'd say, 25% all round. So you can definitely sort of ensure a relatively ooh, excuse me, maximum level of protection. And again, you've got some remote turrets as well. So if you're having any issues with bad guys, you can tell them to fuck off in a nice, glorious fashion. But still... The Redeemer, it is a gloriously gorgeous ship, and I very much like look forward to playing with this ship more, going into the pyro system, doing some much more in-depth bunker missions, all sorts. And it definitely uh, will be in my library for many, many a years. And I also got it for cheap as well, considering that the original price was around, I think, I think it was like 250 let me have a look at the pledge, because I got it when it was really cheap. Yeah, I got it around when it was £250 uh, or dollars. Now it's 325 So I saved a 75 on a bundle, and I'm very happy about that. So, yeah, very good ship. Heavy, man maneuverability-wise, not great, but its firepower more than makes up for its lack of being able to dodge. As we finish our journey with the Avenger Titans, we now go to another extremely popular and well-known ship in the Aegis Dynamic Fleet. I, of course, am talking about the Vanguard series. Now, there are four wondrous ships within the lineup, and one of which is probably the more popular when it comes to PvPers, and there's one which I retained for quite some time until I realized it was the only ship I flew. I won't lie, I fell in love with it the moment I saw it, and I still do have a bit of a soft spot for it in my heart, but I cannot lie, it did teach me a valuable lesson. So without further ado, I give you the Aegis Vanguard Warden, this wonderful large heavy fighter. In the eyes of Star Citizen lore, is considered more as a heavy reconnaissance, slash heavy, just heavy fighter, uh, which is meant to 
duke it out amongst the stars with the best of them. It has a size 4 Annihilator Cannon, or actually to be specific, the Revenant Gatling Cannon, alongside the MVSA Cannon, which are these little, these size 2 little pointy things at the front. Sadly, you can only change them, you can only change them to be other things. You can't, unfortunately, uh, can't sort of, you, there aren't any other sort of weapon hard points on the front, sadly. So it's, eh, not such a huge fan of that. But you do get some rather nice size 3 missiles. Uh, four size 3 arrestor missiles, followed by a couple of racks, which gives you four size 4 dominators and four size 2 ignites. That's all for stock levels. And then, of course, because this is a heavy fighter, it has a manned turret, which is utilizing two size 2 repeater saw back or saw buck but again down to the customizables factor so these particular ships are pretty much form over function once again uh, this one i said being the vanguard warden the finger quote basic of the series having uh primarily a role just to sort of be the heavy duke around maybe some reconnaissance like in terms of law this i think does is able for a pilot and his co-pilot to live in for some time so it gives them the ability to kind of manage i mean for example there is a uh, shit shower so there is the option i don't know how many days you could survive in this thing but i would imagine if, uh, at least a week anymore and you probably want to get your suit changed but no, this thing, this particular ship was under my control for quite well. Oh my God. I owned one of these ships. It was one of the first sort of major investments I had into Star Citizen. And I really, really loved it. And I kind of overused it a bit. Like, it was one of the things, ships that kind of made me realize that there is such a thing as too much. And I found myself using this ship for practically everything from box missions to bank bunker missions to even simple bounty missions i did not use any other vessel in my fleet despite having a fairly decent nice amount of choice so i decided to make i elected to make the decision to actually upgrade from this ship towards the originally to then to the carrick and then finally i then decided to upgrade to the then I upgraded that to the seat, uh, the A2 Hercules, which I would say was a pretty solid decision. But yeah, this is the ship. It's incredible. I'm not going to deny that. And it definitely has a soft spot in my heart. But I also realize it's dangerous to have such ships in your heart because they'll never, be, nothing out of else will ever be used. So this was the other ship that had a soft spot in my heart for a very long time until I flew it. <laughs> As per usual, my eyes were bigger than my brain. This, of course, is the Vanguard Harbinger. I can never fucking pronounce the word properly, so I always call it the Hellbringer, because it pretty much did the same thing. So instead of utilizing a Gatling gun and laser, tur laser turrets at the front, instead it replaced it with a size 4 gimbaled... Oh, I can never remember this bloody weapon's name. The C-788 cannon, which is basically physical projectiles with physical projectile cannons, which is are these size 2... Uh, the CVSA cannons. Now, again, this is the stock value, so you could customize it. But what was what made this particular ship more unique is that, apart from its obviously manned turret, which had the Jericho XL size twos, and a bunch of um, you know the same sort of thing, Arrestor three size two missiles, size three missiles. It also fielded three size five torpedoes, known as which were the Stalker fives. Now, that's a pretty funky, awesome sh uh, deal here. And we'll just have a quick little peep inside just to showcase this fact. So, again, very similar layout as before, but now you see torpedoes with a love by Aegis Dynamics. So you can see the little differences between the two. And I thought I really wanted this ship until I flew it for a bit and then suddenly realized oh no because the big downside with this vessel is it is a heavy bitch and despite um the promise of Daka Daka with cannon even now it's and more so even now the cannon was just useless alongside the other projectile cannons so it just it felt like there wasn't really a lot to benefit from it which surprised me very much and then of course when i discovered the anvil gladiator well that ship may not be as big and may not be as heavily armored but it's far far more maneuverable and had four size five torpedoes rather than the three that this ship had 
But let's say you're not so fussed about that. Let's say you just think that, you know, the Vanguard um, is a really cool ship and you really want to be just that guy who darts in and out of combat. Um, and, you know, you and despite your best efforts, the Warden just couldn't get it for you. Well, I let me introduce you to the Hoplite. So the Vanguard Hoplite, uh, strange name, but still, um, is the troop transport variant. And I'm going to finger quote troop transport here, because really you can get about a squad size. Maybe a fire team is more appropriate. Uh, but still, it's it's still a Vanguard, which has the size 4 Gatling gun as, as before. The... Um, Again, the name, Revenant Gatling, thank you. Uh, but this time, the size 2 weapons, which look... I have to be fair, I've not really utilized this ship. I've not flown this ship before, but they do look like the projectile BRVS repeaters. So maybe they're they're um, they're but non-ballistic, maybe they're laser. We're not too sure. I said, I've not flown this particular variant, but this particular variant has dropship capacity. And I said, you can get maybe a squad in, or a fire team, depending on how you organize your squads. So it's not really that impressive, to be fair. But again, if you are a fan of the Vanguard series, and you want to have yourself a little bit of a troop transport, and you're not minding so much not being able to be quite so effective in combat, then the Hoplite is something for you. Now, we've gone with the bog standard, we've gone with the tack attacker, and we've gone with the troop transport. Now let me show you probably the most popular version in terms of PvP and probably, arguably, the best version of the ship in Star Citizen. And that is the Vanguard Sentinel. Now the Vanguard Sentinel's main attraction is, well, apart from the fact that it comes with a size 4 attrition, which is a pretty fucking good thing. Uh, for those who don't play Star Citizen, the attritions are famed for having the ability to, instead of just overheating and, you know, stopping like most laser weapons, this one actually gets better damage the hotter it gets, which, big thumbs up. For anyone, any respective flyer out there, big thumbs up. So, you've got the size 4 attrition for repeaters, uh, and then this, and the guns above it are the ATVS repeaters. So once again, we've got some repeaters on repeaters, which is wonderful. And then we've got the usual missile rack. We've got the arresters, the size two. But then we've got another thing: a size four EMP generator, which is fantastic. Someone had the bloody uh, medical count here, GG. And also, it has the most, it has the coolest looking interior. I have to of all of the Vanguard series. Like you've got this funky sort of display here, which I love. It's so cool. And of course, we have all the different engineer stations and all the other jazz. And it's got this really lovely blue tint lighting. Like if I was ever to own another Vanguard series, and I kind of kicking myself because it was actually there was a time where the Vanguard Warden was more expensive than the Vanguard Sentinel. But I think as the ship's popularity increased, they'd also <laughs> increase the price. I mean, don't quote me on that. I just I remember vaguely seeing the Sentinel. Not I think maybe when the technology wasn't implemented yet is probably the correct term. Um, uh, because EMPs were were new, for weren't as new. Um, I, I don't think we had EMP functional EMP, so this ship was effectively the same as the Warden. But then when it got the EMP, oh boy, yeah, it it, it its popularity grew in stature because it still retains that heavy fighterness and heavy dominance that the Vanguard Warden had, but. The size 4 EMP meant that now it could bugger over enemy vessels, and it also had a pretty, pretty okay turret as well. I mean, to be fair, I probably would replace the guns on that if I were a Daka Daka PvPer, but maybe because I don't know a lot about PvPing in Star Citizen, maybe I don't know. But the attritions and the everything else seems like a pretty solid deal, so I'll take it. But yeah, the Sant Vanguard Sentinel is probably the only ship I would really consider purchasing again. If I was if I was to get another Vanguard ship, that would be the one to grab. Warden is beautiful. Don't get me wrong; it's lovely, but <laughs> big but um, the the EMP is without a doubt the big attraction factor of that ship, without a doubt. So, there you go, the Vanguard series, the heavy sluggers of Aegis Dynamics, and now we go on to ones which deploy possibly the largest of slammers inside Star Citizen. Well, that we can fly. 
As we enter the last room inside the showcases uh, before we hit the holodecks, I only have one real word to describe both of these vessels. Kazoom! Or bang, in other words. These particular vessels have possibly the most powerful weapons in Star Citizen at this moment in time. They're not easy to fire, for sure, but if they hit the target, there's a very, very, very good chance there's not going to be much left of said target when they go around for another crack. And that is, of course, that both of these vessels have size 9 torpedoes, the largest torpedo slash weapon in the game that is available to the players. So first of all, let's look at the, le the smaller but more cooler side of the ships in Aegis Dynamics, and probably in my personal opinion, the coolest looking ship in the Aegis Dynamics fleet. And this, of course, is the Eclipse. The Eclipse is a dedicated stealth bomber torpedo ship. I'm not, to be fair, I'm not entirely sure how I would have it. It's either stealth fighter, stealth bomber, stealth ship. I, I kind of like the concept of stealth bomber just because it looks so much like the B-2 and the F-1117. Uh, but I'm... Details. Of course, the main is the main fun about this particular ship is, of course, that this vessel has three size nine torpedoes tucked in to this to this underbelly, and that's it. Um, there's not really a lot to defend when it comes to this vessel. Uh, well, this vessel is very much a case of if you get spotted, you die. And I have flown this vessel like twice. And on both occasions, I was spotted, and on very much as soon as I was spotted on said both occasions, I died. <laughs> it was really bad. Though this ship does have a very nice cockpit. I've, I've, I've been not so doing so well with the whole not sharing so much in the cockpits, but this one is pretty cool. The whole thing kind of just... Uh... Here we go. You do have a very nice display. Which is pretty cool. I don't think I would ever use this particular... I don't think I'd ever purchase this kind of ship. Because while, you know, it's cool. It, at the same time, um... Yeah, it's not quite the same. Though, do I have... No, there's, there should be a button that allows me to, um... Eh. Well, there we go. So as you can see, the size 9 torpedoes are absolutely ginormous. Like, holy crap. And as I said, you have three of these bastards. So the main point of this ship is that it's very, very good at hiding itself. It's IR, it's engine signatures, all of that. It is meant to be as stealthy as possible, so that the moment the enemy realizes you're there, you're already darting out towards the next base, and the enemy vessel slash base will be completely nuked. Because here's the thing, you can actually target ground vehicles in this thing, and ground defenses. Starts, CIG haven't done a very good job in helping you do such things, for example with bunker missions, though I do hope in future they do kind of redesign how you can deal with ground vehicles or ground threats, because I think if you can do something like that, it would make bunker missions either much easier slash more less difficult to do if you're doing something on a simple case, and more intriguing and more interesting. But hey ho. Anyway, going from the most stealthiest of ships to probably the loudest bastard in the group, the Retaliator. Now, the interesting thing about the Retaliator is it's got... It, it's more... and it, I would say it's a dedicated bomber, though to be fair, this ship is also planned to be one of the ships that has like kind of very modular internal organs. It is planned, though to be fair, we haven't really seen any signs of development that there will be a basic version of this ship, which will be more of a cargo hold and everything else like that. So at the moment, this particular ship houses the most size 9 torpedoes in Star Citizen that is available for players. We have, let's see, uh, four, two, so six size 9 torpedoes in this one ship. There's a front rack which has four size 9 torpedoes, and there's a rear rack which has 
two size 9 torpedoes. And this vessel is incredibly cramped. I've been in this vessel long enough times to be able to showcase. And again, this ship has been around and showed off a fair amount of times. But this particular vessel definitely could do with a retrofit in terms of internal organs. Because it feels very, 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 very cramped. Um, like, if you're going to be using this ship... The main intention of this vessel is you're going to be kind of shooting from a very long way away. You'll need someone to relay the coordinates of a target, because if you're anywhere near the enemy guns, you will die very quickly. But, again, if you can hit the target, it's a size 9 torpedo. Not a lot of ships can stand up to a size 9 torpedo. At least, not a lot of player flyable ships can stand up. I think the only ship I know that can withstand a size 9 torpedo, or multiple size 9 torpedo hits... Oh, handy. Is the 890 jump. And I think she can only, like, take two or three of those before she blows up. So, definitely not a... Uh, a thing to mess with, for sure. But as said, it's very glassy. Uh, both of these ships, in their own ways, are quite glassy. That one basically explodes the moment anything with a relatively decent gun looks at it, and this thing explodes if anyone even notices it. <laughs> Or at least, uh, if it can't get out of dodge beforehand. Because the only real defenses this ship has is its manned turrets. And they're not that many of them. I mean, they've got some form of defense, of course. But in comparison to other ships of the line, this ship is very, very vulnerable. And it's a little bit of an old gem now. It definitely could do with a re redesign retrofit. You know, the whole works. But, then again, size 9 torpedoes. So... Anyone who wants to have a go at this ship, but good fucking luck is all I will say, because otherwise, yeah, not that good. As we make our way into the holodeck, we are greeted with, of course, the sight of the next generation of ships in Star Citizen's plans to release. One of which is all about supporting the fleet, and one of which is all about leaving little presents for the poor bastard who has to try and navigate through an asteroid field. And, um... God Emperor help those who follow in his wake. So the first ship we're going to be having a look at is the Nautilus. The Nautilus is a mine-laying ship, which doesn't... I can't say looks hugely attractive, I'll be honest with you, but it does have a bit of a unique concept and unique design. As you can see, it's quite a thin-ish looking ship with some, mo with some pretty impressive weapons. If we have a look at the weapons, actually... Uh, we have some size, two size 7 guns, which is pretty impressive. It's like a Corvette sense style ship as well. It's not like a, it's not like a small ship. Like, the, these holodecks, what they do tend to make a little, what they tend to sort of, what well, doesn't help them, of course, in terms of uh, designing, is they make the ship seem really puny. <laughs> When in actual fact, this is meant to be more of a size of a Corvette and more things. Like, you can see the turret on the side here. This is not by any means a re you know unreasonable size. So, understandably, you want to have something that... You can definitely feel this. You can definitely feel as the t years go by. I mean, this ship was announced a few years ago. I think it was 2019 when it was first announced, and you can see as slowly but surely we're getting further and further down the line. The production is getting down the line, and the details are getting much, much better. Aesthetically pleasing wise, eh. <laughs> it's not something I'm overly fussed about. But the concept of a mine laying ship is still pretty damn cool. So. As mentioned, this particular ship is designed to either have mines that will effectively fly up, blow themselves up, causing a lot of damage to enemy vessels, or you can get some drones which will be able to uh, fly around and ex obviously removing uh, and deploying, removing or deploying or doing whatever with the mines. And finally, there's a sentry mine, which is basically, instead of just exploding, um, instead it basically acts like a sentry system. So there it gives you the ability and, you know, gives the, any clans or any orgs or any particular things, or the UEE fleets, the ability to counter any kind of major push and hopefully res reduce the chances of enemy fleets being able to sneak around the back and do some untold levels of damage, because, yeah... That would suck, and Vandal have done quite a fair amount of damage already, so not looking forward to what kind of crap uh, will happen if this thing gets missed out. But still, I'm liking the ship. It looks cool. I'm 
not entirely desiring of getting this ship, but it would be interesting to see what kind of presence in the universe will have occur when this thing is sent into the... It's also got VTOL thrusters, from what I can tell. Unless that's just really well-designed little things. It looks like it's VTOL capable. So I'm thinking VTOL capable thrusters, which means it's going to be a lot easier to land in Atmo, that's for sure. Anyway, moving on to the second ship, which I... I have to admit, I'm a little bit more excited over before. But that's more because I'm a freak than anything else. Of course, we're looking for the Vulcan. And the Vulcan looks even more detailed than it was... It almost looks more detailed than the bloody uh, Nautilus, which is a first. So, what is the Vulcan? I'm around of people talking, Judy. Oh, hello. So, what exactly is the Vulcan? Well, the Vulcan is quite simply a fleet support ship. It's got drones on the side which help either refuel, rearm, and in some cases repair when it comes to uh, when it comes to ships. I mean its main purpose is to refuel and repair, but I can imagine you could easily snake a couple bags of like ammunition on or anything else like that. Like they say repair and refuel, but you can always find that there's someone who's like, right, put in that space an extra can of ammunition, because you never know. So basically, what this utilizes is drones, primarily. Uh, listing on the, said on the website, which I'm once again referencing from Tool's website here, basically it utilizes four barbed drones that can hold fuel, that can hold small fuel, amounts of fuel, ammo, for, or fuel or ammo for friendly ships, or repair them with built-in tools. Two drones may be active at any time, controlled by two manned support system stations on the, dro on the Vulcan. The other two drones are stored in the Vulcan unless needed for a replacement or for an alternative task. So this particular ship is going to probably be very popular and uh, with certain orgs. Or it could just be for solo enterprises basically coming into certain sectors. Maybe an outpost on the fringe who, you know, you, you charge people. Hey, do you want, you know, a quick refuel? Do you want some re-ammunition? I can fix your ship. Your ship looks a bit down. All those sorts of things. And it makes that particular ship a very useful asset for any large-scale clan organization or clan op which allows you to you know, make those operations, those long-term operations possible, which I personally think is a really cool addition. And also, it looks really cool as well. I have to, I, I said, I'm a sad git. Um, the mundane kind of jobs in Star Citizen are the ones that appeal to me the most. So, just watch this space before you, <laughs> for our, um, Argo, Argo Day, because you're, you're going to see me just gushing over all of the shit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> But yeah, so this 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 really cool looking ship is something that I'm very much keen on seeing in near the future, and I'm really hoping we get to see more ships of this kind. Like Star Citizen, I know it's a lot about just adventure and fighting in space and doing all the most exciting things, but sometimes some of the best things I've been able to do in Star Citizen is the most mundane of things. Flying through a refinery, going into a trader's post, uh, learning how to mine effectively, all of these little tiny things that... In in the grand scheme of things, it's just mundane, but it really is exciting to do it in the Star Citizen setting, which is why I'm so, so, so keen for 318, because I want to be that boring sod who loads ships all day with his mule, because that's cool, it's a spaceship, it's still exciting. No, I'm not a sad git, shut up. <laughs> oh dear god. Anyway. So there you guys go. That is Aegis Day. A bit of a... Again, it's pretty much we've seen the same side of things before. There's nothing really new coming out, at least in terms of flyability, in terms of in, in Aegis Dynamics, which is fair enough. I mean, we've the Corsair has definitely been... I think if any other sort of big major ships came out, I think they would be... Um, sort of stealing the thunder of the Corsair, so it makes sense that they would do something like this. But still, Aegis Dynamics is still a really awesome company, uh, has some very solid cho choices for vessels, and if you're a new player to Star Citizen and you want some sort of good combat ships, Aegis Dynamics is, is, a, is definitely a ship manufacturer that can answer some of your questions in terms of what ships are cool and can do some pretty funky stuff. And in the near future, hopefully, we'll start seeing some of these ships, which have more of a utilitarian approach, being thrown once finally back into their element. Though I fear we may not see the Reclaimer's uh, proper 
call to use um, until much later, sadly. But who knows? Salvage may become a new thing that everyone focuses on in 2023 or 2153. Christ. Anyway, I'll, that'll be it for today. So for tomorrow, we've got Alien Day. Still, there may be something cool about Alien Day. We do have some new concepts coming in. So who knows? Maybe the Xenos will have something that will pique my interest. Or maybe they won't. We'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But thank you very much for watching. If you like this kind of content, let me know in the comment section down below. And also talk about your ships. If there's a ship that you think I got some information wrong about. Or if there's a ship you think I don't, that you like that I didn't like. Do let me know in the comment section down below. I do love to hear your feedback about these things. I do love to talk about the ships. Because sometimes the best conversations are when we're debating as to what ships better and we all know at the end of the day um, the best types of comp they always end up with a wonderful exchange and in certain cases if you're in pyro a literal exchange so thank you once again for watching and i will see you on alien day this is mr jaeger signing out have a good one